Heavenly Father, Lord of heaven and earth, Lord, here we are to worship you. We're here to hear from your word, Lord, and I pray, I pray, Lord, that you would speak this morning. Let it be nothing good that I have to say, but let it be your word, pure and true, that you, Father, would encourage, would you convict us, would you challenge us, would you show us in which the, the areas and the places that we need to grow in. Lord, would we be able to apply your word to our life, and would we ultimately see how in these scriptures, throughout all of the Bible, is a treasure, and that treasure is Christ, Lord, and how he is precious and how he is wonderful. Would Christ be exalted today, Lord? Would he be our one passion, Lord, our one desire, the thing that fulfills us and gives us purpose? Would we see Christ as altogether lovely this morning and his cross, Lord, everything that he endured for our sake, would it speak to us this morning? Lord, again, I pray that your Holy Spirit would be upon me and upon this congregation as we read the word of God. I ask and pray in Jesus' name, amen. Well, I went ahead and entitled this sermon, The Cross of Christ. The cross of Christ is a central theme in this last chapter of the book of Galatians. It's also a central theme throughout the whole book of Galatians. And now you may notice that you do not have your regular bulletin insert. Uh, that was on purpose. I did not forget. And I will do that from time to time. I actually want to encourage you this morning not to take notes. If you brought a journal with you, if you have something you typically do, I don't want you to do that. If you can't help yourself, then that's fine. But this morning, I want you to just listen. I want you to hear the Word of God. I want it to speak to you as you hear the preaching of the Word. And this is, a, uh, this is something I've prayed through quite a bit about what is preaching? You know, what is its aim? What is its goal? Why do I stand up here and do this? Is it simply to give you information? That's part of it but it's certainly not less than that. Yes, I want to convey truth. I want you to be taught. I want you to know what the Scripture says. But preaching is so much more than just teaching. Preaching itself is aimed at the heart, your heart. Preaching is something that we experience together, that as I preach, the Holy Spirit moves and is working in your heart. And so sometimes when we're taking notes, sometimes when we're paying to the slideshow or when it's not on the correct slide and you're wondering where I'm at and there's all these distractions, it can get difficult to follow along and you might miss out on what the Holy Spirit is trying to say. So I don't want you to miss out this morning. I want this morning to be fully led by the Holy Spirit. Again, nothing that I have to say is important. It's strictly what this book has to say that is important. So this morning, relax, pay attention, listen to what I have to say, but don't worry about taking the notes. Don't worry about remembering this later. Just be present here and now. All right, well, let's go ahead and let's read the text. I do have the text up here. I do have that for you. If you have your Bibles, though, I encourage you to look along in that, but we're going to begin Galatians chapter 6, beginning in verse 11. Paul says, See with what large letters I am writing to you with my own hand. It is those who want to make a good showing in the flesh who would force you to be circumcised, and only in order that they may not be persecuted for the cross of Christ. For even those who are circumcised do not themselves keep the law, but they desire to have you circumcised, that they may boast in your flesh. But far be it from me to boast, except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by which the world has been crucified to me, and I to the world. For neither circumcision counts for anything, nor uncircumcision, but a new creation. And as for all who walk by this rule, peace and mercy be upon them and upon the Israel of God. From now on, let no one cause me trouble, for I bear on my body the marks of Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit, brothers. 
Amen. This is the word of the Lord for this Lord's day. So, we have gone through this journey in the book of Galatians. We've gone through all six chapters. And I hope by now that we know why Paul is writing this book. He's writing this book specifically to address the issue of the Judaizers spreading a false gospel amongst the Gentile believers. And that false gospel is that they must adopt the law of Moses in order to be saved, in order to be justified. You must keep circumcision particularly if you are to be considered righteous in the eyes of God. But Paul writes back to the Gentiles as well as to his opponent saying, this is false, this is not the true gospel. The true gospel is that we are saved by grace alone through faith in Jesus Christ. Is this the message that you've been hearing the last six, seven, eight weeks? Yes? I hope so. I hope this is what you've been hearing because this is what Paul has been saying. And so he reminds us that we are under the law if we are outside of Christ. And so we all were once in that position. Or perhaps there may be some of us who are still in that position this morning. But when you are under the law, the Bible says that you are under a curse. That you are enslaved and imprisoned to the law. There is no escape for you. You are waiting in your jail cell until the day of your execution. That is what it's like to be under the law. Or to be under the law is like trying to swim across a body of water, let's say the Feather River, for example. That's hard enough already, but now imagine you're being given a one-ton weight and, say, and you're being told, swim across. You're going to drown. You're going to die. That's what it's like to be under the law. But that is where the good news of Jesus Christ comes in. Paul tells us that the good news is that Jesus Christ has set us free from the law. And he does this primarily through the cross of Christ. But we're going to look more specifically now at the text. I think we know what the book of Galatians is saying, what it's trying to communicate. I think it can be summed up in three parts for you to remember. Chapters 1 and 2 deal specifically with the issue of authority. And what I mean is the Judaizers were challenging Paul's authority. So the first two chapters is Paul saying, look, I am an apostle of Jesus Christ. The message has come from God himself to me. So he identifies his authority. And we know that Paul is someone who's trustworthy, someone that we should listen to. The second issue is salvation. How is somebody actually saved? As I just said, the Judaizers believed it was by keeping the law of Moses. Paul says it is by believing in Jesus Christ. So chapters 3 and 4 deal with that issue. How is a man justified before God? Again, it is by faith alone in Jesus. And then chapters 5 and 6 deal specifically with sanctification, with our personal holiness. So when you read chapters 5 and 6, like we've talked about, it gets very practical. It gets very specific about how you are to live as a Christian, as someone who has been redeemed from the law, someone who has been adopted into the family of God and is a new creation. Chapters 5 and 6 tells you how to do that. What were some of the things that we learned? Galatians 5, 6 says very clearly, For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything, but only faith working through love. That's what matters. And then again, he essentially repeats himself in verse 14. He says, for the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, watch out that you are not consumed by one another. And as he repeats in Galatians 6, verse 2, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. So this is the essence of this book. If you want to know how to be a Christian, you want to know how to live the Christian life, and you're not sure where to go to do that, read this book and read it again. Read it time and time again until you understand the basics, and then go on to Ephesians and Colossians and the first, first book of John. These are all ways and books that teach us how to live the Christian life. Okay, now let's, I want to go verse by verse with you. 
I want to look at this text and pull out all that it has for us this morning. So look with me again at verse 11. Paul says, See with what large letters I am writing to you with my own hand. So Paul, typically, when he would write a letter, he would have somebody write it for him. He would dictate it, and they would copy it for him. It was someone who was professional, a professional scribe, because Paul, he wasn't that. So his handwriting, you know, different things weren't perfect. It wouldn't have been clear or easy, perhaps, to read or understand. And that's why some think when he says, look at what large letters, he's saying, look, I am an amateur in the terms of writing, but I want you to know it is I who is saying these things specifically to you. I think if I could sum it up easily why Paul says this in verse 11, he's calling attention to the final words that he is about to say. He says, look at the large letters. It is in my own handwriting. I want you to pay attention to this. This is important. So what does he say then? These are the final words to Paul to the Galatians that he wants them to remember. Verse 12, he says, It is those who want to make a good showing in the flesh who would force you to be circumcised and only in order that they may not be persecuted for the cross of Christ. So when Paul says it is those who want to make a good showing, who is he talking about? Who is the who is those? It's the Judaizers. It's the believing Christians that are believing falsely. They believe Jesus is the Messiah, but they believe that to be saved, you still must keep the law of Moses. So when he says it is those, he's talking about the Judaizers, who want to make a good showing in the flesh, which means they want to glory, they want to boast and the fact that they are converting them ultimately to Judaism. But, he, but they do this specifically, it says, in order that they may not be persecuted for the cross of Christ. So something that I saw when reading this passage, I think what has become clear to me is that there's a contrast between the Judaizers and between Paul. And I think we can look at it in this way. There is false religion. We could even say false Christianity because they were believing Jesus as the Messiah, but they weren't believing in the true gospel. But let's just identify it as false religion. So how can you tell if someone is preaching a false teaching or if it is a false religion? Well, firstly, what this text tells us is that they will avoid persecution. They will avoid the offense of the cross which is exactly what Paul said in chapter 5. Look at chapter 5, verse 11. He says, But if I, brothers, still preach circumcision, why am I still being persecuted? In that case, the offense of the cross has been removed. So the Judaizers, they don't want to be persecuted. They don't want the offense that the cross of Christ brings. And it was offensive, especially to the Pharisees, They thought the cross of Christ was the most ridiculous thing that they've ever heard. And so for them to be told, it's like this. There's a parable that Jesus tells where there's an owner of a vineyard, or we could say in our day of a farm. And he goes out into the public markets and he hires laborers. He hires servants. And he says, I want you to come work in my vineyard. I want you to come work on my farm. I want you to harvest. I want you to gather. I want you to plow. I want you to do all these different things. He hires those people at the beginning of the day. And then he goes out again, and he sees that there are some still waiting around. And so he hires them as well. And then even until the very evening, until the last hour of the day, he is telling people to come and to work so that they can make a wage. Now, the challenge here for the workers is that those who were there in the very beginning were promised a specific wage, a denarius, which is just a day's earning. But those who came in later were promised the very same thing. And so those who came early were like, why would you do that? We've been here all day. Shouldn't we get more? And so the owner says, look, I told you the agreements. I said you would get paid this amount. I paid you that amount. I have done you no wrong. If I want to pay them just as much as I paid you, it's my decision. It's my choice. And so that is why the cross of Christ is offensive 
to the Judaizers and to the Pharisees is because that's what they're being told, that they have been keepers of the law. For the last 1,500 years, the Jewish people have been under the law. They have tried to keep it. They think that they're keeping it, and they think that they're deserving of God's blessings for this. And so when they see these Gentiles coming in who are going to receive the inheritance and receive eternal life, even though they've only been working the last hour, it's an offense. How could this be? How is it possible that they've only been here for one hour working when I've been slaving away for 15 hours? Or it can also be compared to this. The Judaizers or the Pharisees can believe themselves to be righteous, to be pure and holy in God's eyes, and the Gentiles were the complete opposite of that. The Gentiles were filthy and impure. They were prostitutes and tax collectors and people that they hated and despised. Yet now these are the people that are going to sit with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of God. How could such a thing be possible? That's exactly what they're saying. So it's an offense to them to hear that they will not be able to enter heaven by keeping the law and that they must go through this man Jesus Now, a third point here is the reality that the cross of Christ itself was an offense because those who were crucified were criminals of the worst kind, murderers and thieves and rapists, all types of horrid sinners were the ones who were crucified. And that was the death that Jesus endured. That's why people mocked and hated him. They saw him up on that cross and they thought to themselves, well, he must just be a wicked sinner because he's up there. Cursed is any man who is hung on a tree. That's how they view Jesus. And now you're saying that I have to believe and follow a man who couldn't even take himself down from the cross? They couldn't accept it for what it was. But that's what it talks about. It says that the cross of Christ is a stumbling block to the Jews. They cannot understand the wisdom of God. And so many of us also fail. Some people say to me, is it really that simple? Is it really that easy to be saved? Yes, it really is that simple that if you put your faith in Jesus Christ and follow him, you will receive eternal life. So the Judaizers, however, they didn't like this. They didn't want to believe this. And so what they wanted to do was what they did in Matthew 23. You can flip there if you want, but I'm going to read it. Matthew 23. So this is what the Pharisees or the Judaizers' goal was. Matthew 23. Verse 15, he says, Woe to you, and this is Jesus speaking, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you travel across sea and land to make a single proselyte, which is a convert. They were trying to convert people. So they would travel far and wide. They would go overseas to try to convert people to Judaism. For you travel across sea and land to make a single proselyte, and when he becomes a proselyte, you make him twice as much a child of hell as yourselves. And Jesus goes on then to describe them as people that don't have the truth themselves, but they will not allow others to also receive the truth. And that's what these Judaizers are like. They really haven't been changed. So, They want to avoid persecution. And that is also what any false religion will do as well. It will not preach Christ. It will not preach the offense of the cross. So it will be avoided. Now let's look at verse 13. For any those who are circumcised, or for even those who are circumcised, do not themselves keep the law. But they desire to have you circumcised, that they may boast in your flesh. So the Judaizers preach circumcision. They preach the law, keep the law. You must do this in order to be saved. Yet they themselves don't even keep the law. They don't practice it. They don't hold to 
what they preach. And that's why Jesus, time and time again, called them hypocrites. When you tell someone to do something, but you yourself are doing that very thing, that makes you a hypocrite. So if you tell your children not to steal, but you are going around stealing, you are a hypocrite. And that's what the Judaizers were. They were hypocrites. They themselves did not keep the law. Which makes you wonder, if they really believed that was the way to be saved, don't you think they would be much more earnest to keep the law? What this really reveals about them is that they know, they know just as much as Paul that the law does not save. Because if it did, they would want to keep the law with all earnestness. But they're not concerned because they know that the law saves nobody. And I also think that's what a false religion is. So firstly, it avoids persecution. But secondly, a false religion will also be hypocritical. They will not practice what they preach. So again, if you're in a church, this is more so to help you with maybe friends or family that finds themselves in churches like this. Or maybe if you go off one day and you move and you're looking for a church, this will be helpful when trying to decide what type of church you should be a part of. You should not be a part of a church that will not preach the Christ, the cross of Christ boldly, and you should not be a part of a church that does not practice what it preaches. And there are many churches like this. All you have to do is examine the leaders in the church. Examine the pastor. Does he say one thing in the pulpit or even to you in a private setting, but then he goes out and does the very things he's telling you not to do? It would be very difficult to follow the leadership of a man like that. If he says, don't do this, but then you see him doing that very thing, you're going to question his integrity. And that's what a false religion does, is they want to put a heavy burden on you to make themselves look better. We want to avoid this at all costs. So, they do not keep the law themselves, but they desire to have you circumcised that they may boast in your flesh. So the third thing that a false religion or a false church or a false teaching will do is its purpose, its intent, is simply to use you whether it's as a number, and that's usually what it is. For example, there are a lot of churches today that will use numbers, like, for example, look how many people we have, look how big our church is and how many thousands of people we can fit in it. But then they will also go beyond that, and they'll use things like baptisms and say, look how many baptisms we've had this last year. Baptism is just the same as circumcision. It is an outward action. So you can be baptized without having anything inside of you actually be changed. And so what these churches do, they've learned that they can manipulate people by pressing upon their emotions. And so there are churches today, this is a real thing, I'm not just making this up. There are churches that will set people in the congregation as the first ones to go up to be baptized. Because when people in the congregation are sitting and they start seeing people they know go up into the congregation and and be baptized, they want to respond and follow that as well. So they'll put fake people in the audience to come up acting as if they're being baptized. They want to do this to encourage people to walk up. But it's not out of a genuine desire to see their lives transformed. It's so that they can mark a number for their church. So they can report it back to their board or to their elders. Look, we had this many people respond. We had 20% more than we had last year. But why is that wrong? It's wrong because what happens to those people that responded simply by emotion? See, the same thing that happens in these churches is they lead people to be baptized, say this is a great thing, but then they don't follow up with them. There's no discipleship. There's no following up with that person to see if they are understanding what it is they just professed and did. Because what matters more, as we're going to learn, is that there was an inward change in that person, not simply the baptism itself. Not simply that circumcision by itself did anything. It was an outward act. But what God really cares about is an inward change in people's lives. So a false religion, they don't care that you're being changed inwardly. They don't, change, they don't care about your life or what you do or if you change. But a true church and a true shepherd will care about you and what you do. Because what did we learn last week? 
The whole idea of this faith is that once we believed and once we're filled with the Holy Spirit, that we want to grow in sanctification. We want to become holier and holier and holier. But if there's nobody pushing you to do that, it's very likely that you'll just stay as you are. But that's exactly what elders and pastors and deacons are for. They are there to push the congregation into growing in holiness. You are called and commanded to grow in holiness. If you are not doing that, you are in sin. Or it is very possible that you have never believed to begin with. So God cares more about an inward change than he does outward actions. And that's what he says in verse 15. We're going to come back to that because I want to look now at verse 14. So three things. Since you don't have notes, since I asked you not to take notes, I'm just going to repeat this so hopefully you remember. But a false religion will teach you to avoid persecution, say nothing offensive, always be politically correct, and especially don't preach the cross of Christ. Secondly, they'll be full of hypocrites. They'll tell you to do one thing, but do something completely different themselves. And the last point was that they just simply want to use you to boast. They want to use you as a number. They want to use you to exalt themselves. So these are all things to be weary of, to be concerned about. If you ever find yourself in a new church or in a new fellowship of believers, be thinking about these things. Or if you know people in settings like this, we want to pray for them to come out of it because I stand here, I tell you very clearly, there are a lot of false churches, a lot of false teachers, and a lot of people being led astray. That is why we must hold to the Word of God, because it is our guide, and it will help us to live this life. Okay, but now we're going to look at the comparison. What is a true religion? What does it look like for us? Verse 14, but far be it from me, Paul says, to boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. For neither circumcision counts for anything nor uncircumcision, but a new creation. I'm going to stop there. So firstly, a true faith, true Christianity at its center will always preach Christ crucified. No matter how offensive people may think it is, it will always be at the center of any godly ministry. Why is that? Because the cross of Christ is the foundation of this whole thing that we're doing. If the cross did not exist, if Jesus did not die, then why are we here this morning? We are here because Jesus died and he rose again. So the cross of Christ is the foundation. And I want to share with you a few points about why the cross of Christ is so important. I want to frame it around the question of why does Paul boast in the cross of Christ so much? Well, firstly, what he's doing is he doesn't want to call attention to himself like the Judaizers were doing. The Judaizers wanted to be lifted up and exalted. Paul doesn't care about that. He's not trying to please men, as we learned from chapter 1. He wants people to see Christ for all that he is. So he boasts in the cross because he knows that he himself is nothing, but that Jesus is everything. So here are a few things that the cross of Christ actually accomplished for us that we have learned from the book of Galatians. Firstly, we have learned that the cross of Christ brings about our justification. Do you remember what justification means? Justification is a legal term. It means are you innocent or are you guilty? And who are we innocent or guilty before? God. So your justification is very important because if you are guilty before God on the day of judgment, then what happens to you? You go to jail, a.k.a. hell. It's true. But if you are innocent, if you are justified before God, then you will enter into everlasting life. And again, the whole point of this book is that you cannot do it in your own goodness and your own righteousness. You can only do it 
through faith in Jesus Christ, and that is what he accomplished on the cross. He has turned us from darkness, and he has brought us into the light so that we can be seen as righteous before God's eyes. Because on that day, if we are not clothed in the blood of Christ, we will embrace, we will receive God's due wrath and judgment for our sin. As we read last week, that each man will have to bear his own load. Next, the cross of Christ accomplished for us our redemption. And what I mean specifically by that is that God can't just simply make us justified just because he's God. Just like a judge can't just pass pardon on people just because he's a judge. There has to be a reason or there has to be some sort of payment for the fine or different things like that. And that's what Jesus did. So we can't just walk away freely If God just let every sinner walk away freely without doing anything else, we would look at him as kind of an unjust God for not dealing with sin. But he did deal with sin, again, through the cross of Jesus Christ. But how specifically did he do that? Well, we look back to the Old Testament. How did they deal with sin then? It was through sacrifice. And it was specifically the blood that brought about forgiveness. The blood of the animals were splashed on the altar, and it was what atoned For their sins. It is what covered it. And that is exactly what the blood of Jesus Christ has done. That is what is meant by redemption that your sins have been forgiven because Jesus Christ bore them on himself. As the scripture says, he who knew no sin became sin for us so that we do not have to bear the punishment of it. So the cross of Christ secured our justification. And then it secured our redemption. God provided so that we could be forgiven. Next, the cross of Christ also accomplished our adoption. So again, God would be still great and wonderful and worthy of worship if he just accomplished those two things. But again, he goes above and he goes beyond for our sake. And the way that he does that is by adopting us into his family. We are not just forgiven citizens that go on living their lives. No, we're brought into the kingdom of God. We're brought into the very castle of the king, and we're given a room to stay in. That is what Jesus Christ did on the cross for us. He adopted you. That comes from Galatians chapter 4, chapter 5, and really through the whole book. We are adopted. We become sons and daughters of the Most High. And now lastly, what the cross of Christ accomplished is our freedom. Freedom from sin, freedom from hell, Jesus set us free. That's what he says in Galatians 5, verse 13. You were called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. So that is why the Apostle Paul boasts in the cross of Christ. Because can you justify yourself before God? Can you redeem yourself before God? Can you make yourself a part of God's family? And can you set yourself free? You can't do any of those things. Only God can. And he did that through the cross of Christ. That is why Paul boasts in it so much. So, true religion will preach Christ unashamedly. It is at the center of every healthy ministry. Now, Paul says then, except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by which the world has been crucified to me, and I to the world. A true church, a true religion, true faith looks like being dead to the world. Are you dead to the world? Did people mourn your loss when you became a Christian? Did you lose friends when you became a Christian? When we become followers of Christ, we become dead to the ways of the world. This is how you can know if you're in a good church. Does that church practice and adopt every worldly principle and idea? Do they bring you in because they promise you fun and entertainment? Well, I know chili cook-offs are pretty good. (laughs) But I promise you my intention for that is not to get you just to be here. It's just fun to fellowship. I promise. That's really why. But that's what false religions will do. They'll bring you in with false ideas using the ways of the world to get you to come in. They will gear things toward your fleshly nature. Now, we must die to the world 
Again, Paul says this time and time again, those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. All right, now here is probably the most important verse in this whole text. He says, for neither circumcision counts for anything nor uncircumcision, but a new creation. And this is what I was talking about before. This is the crux of the whole book of Galatians. If you could pick one verse that describes it, it's verse 15. This is Paul's whole point. It does not matter if you circumcise yourself or even if you don't. Any outward sign, anything that you do, I don't care about it. What I care about and what God cares about is that there has been an inward change in your life, that you have become a new creation, that you have been born again and are filled with the Holy Spirit. That is what matters, and that is true Christianity. Without that inward change, you are lost. There is no hope for you. But it is through that inward change that we are made new and alive. How does that inward change come about? Through faith in Jesus and His cross. When you believe in that, you are changed. You are filled with the Holy Spirit. It is the only way that can happen. And then he goes on to say, And as for all who walk by this rule, and that rule specifically is the cross of Christ and the new creation, those who believe in this, those who live by it, will what? They will be blessed with peace and mercy. So in all and as for all who walk by this rule, peace and mercy be upon them and upon the Israel of God. And that's something important for us to hear. That even though we were all Gentiles, we are a part of the true Israel that belongs to God. We're not just Gentiles because in Christ, remember what it said that precious verse, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is no male and female, for you are all one in Christ, and if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to promise. That is what it means to be blessed as the Israel of God. Now he says, from now on, let no one cause me trouble, for I bear on my body the marks of Jesus. <laughs> When I read this, it's almost like Paul is kind of over it. He's made his point. He's stated his case. And he just says, look, please don't bother me about this anymore because I've suffered for the sake of Christ long enough. And we've read that list of Paul's suffering, how he was beaten, he was shipwrecked, he was stoned, he was left for dead time and time again. What he's saying is, is I am aligned with the risen Jesus. I have the marks of Christ on my body. So I don't need to deal with these silly false teachers anymore. You know the testimony of my word. You know that it is true. You know that Jesus Christ suffered and died for our sake and is coming back again. But the question for everyone here this morning is do you bear the marks of Jesus on your body? Have you suffered for the sake of Christ? Have you endured persecution and trial? You know, it's a requirement for Christians to suffer with Christ. That's what Romans 8 talks about. Paul says that we will inherit all these things provided that we suffer with him. And that's why the Judaizers couldn't get it. Because the very first thing they said was, we want to avoid the persecution. We don't want that. No, as Christians, we should welcome it. Sounds kind of crazy, but it's true. And that's the challenge for all of us is are we living too carefully where, again, people see us and they're not bothered by our faith? The reality is people should be bothered that we love Jesus so much. The identity of Jesus freak should be all of us. When people look at us, there goes that weirdo that loves Jesus so much. We must all bear the marks of Christ. The only way to do this, though, is what is implied in verse 18. Paul says his final words, The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit, brothers. Amen. None of this is possible without the grace of Christ. That's what this whole faith and religion is all about. It's about Jesus' grace and how he gave himself for each and every one of us. 
how he died, how he suffered, how he humbled himself, how he loved one another, how he modeled all of that for his disciples and how he models it for us to this day. You cannot live the Christian life if it were not for the grace of God. It's impossible. You cannot live it in your own flesh and in your own glory. It is through the grace of Christ alone. And I think it's a beautiful way to end this book of Galatians. For we are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Jesus Christ. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for this opportunity to preach your word. I pray, Lord, that everything that was said or shared, would you take it, would you take it Lord, and impress it upon our hearts, Lord. Remind us of its truths. I pray for these people now, Lord, that you would speak to them. And not only here and now, but as the week goes on, would you continue to speak and continue to work in our hearts, Lord, that we would not be afraid of persecution, that we would not be afraid to boast in the cross of Christ, but that we, Lord, would bear the marks of Jesus, that we would be true Christians in a world that is so in desperately need of it. Help us to be set apart. Help us to be different, Lord. I pray, Father, that you change our hearts and our minds, that we would put everything in Christ and Him alone. There's nothing else, Lord. Bless your people, Lord, as we finish up here. In Jesus' name, amen.